My name is uh, Joanne Fox, and I am, have the privilege of serving as the principal of Vantage College. And I'm Sandra zappa -Honman, and I am the Academic English Program Director at Vantage. Okay, thank you. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, and today we're going to do some storytelling, um, and we hope that you will take away some lessons learned. So uh, for me, that land acknowledgement is particularly meaningful as I consider that this land and this place has been a place where storytelling has been used as an educational tool. And so I, um, in making that acknowledgement, I reflect on how the stories we tell are so important to um, the lessons we take away uh, with us each day. So um, that has been happening in this space for thousands of years. Um, and we hope today's story will be of use to you. Today, you are part of uh, us launching. So this is our first departmental speaker series. So thank you for coming. I, when you launch something like this, you're always like, how many people will come? I am so happy to see so many of you here. So we are actually going to launch a speaker series. This is the first speaker series today. Um, and the idea of the Vantage speaker series will be uh, to provide a forum for um, our faculty and our staff um, and our students here in the Vantage College community to share some of their work. So we hope to um, share showcases of some of the types of teaching and learning initiatives that we are um, playing with here at the college, um, either to um, enrich the student experience or how we've uh, experimented with something and found that it's helped to engage students, so, um, or talk about interdisciplinarity. So if you have ideas for topics that you'd like to see us talk about, um, we're going to provide an opportunity for you to provide some of that input at a survey at the end. Um, many of our faculty and staff have um, expertise and have built expertise over the past five years at strategies for kind of creating um, creative, uh, linguistic, and culturally responsive space. So um, we're hoping that we can uh, create, invite them to do talks, panels, showcases, any number of, of uh, formats. So that's what this speaker series will be. We aim to have sort of four or so events per year. So keep your eyes out for that, and you are all very much welcome. And to begin, what we thought um, with the first speaker series is that we would give a bit of an overview of what Vantage is. So I will start the talk um, with uh, a little bit of an overview of what, what we are, some of the student outcomes, and then Sandra will tell you a little bit more about the curricular models. But before I go into that, I wanted to get also a sense of who we have in the room with us to hear. So how many people in this room uh, find themselves today in a faculty role? Okay, so that is about maybe a third of the audience. How many find themselves in the staff uh, type role? Okay, um, do we have students here as well today? Yeah, great, we have a great mix in the room. Um, how many people here in the room um, are involved uh, directly today um, uh, in the delivery of Vantage uh, One programs. So look around the room, those are some of the uh, faculty and staff and students involved in delivery of the programs. How many of you in the room um, know that you have met a Vantage student before? <laughs> so that there's more people there that put up their hands. So some of you may have met a Vantage student before, may, may not have known it. Um, so I'll come to that and, and wh who these students are and, and where they, how they progress through our programs at UBC. So what is Vantage? Um, Vantage is, given there's such a mix in the room, I will do a quite a broad overview. We are a Senate-approved academic unit. Um, the programs we deliver, Vantage College is the unit, and then the programs that we deliver are called Vantage One uh, programs. And they are really an, an enriched first-year programs, and our mandate um, are up are written up there, but it's all about inspiring and enabling student success. So um, we align with the transformative teaching um, mandate of UBC, from UBC's uh, strategic plan, and, and we think about transformative teaching both through classroom experiences, but also in the mentoring, advising, and the holistic view of the student experience. 
Um, this place really serves as an interdisciplinary hub where we have uh, faculty and staff with expertise in applied linguistics and faculty with disciplinary expertise who are uh, collaborating together to create kind of uh, new ways of teaching and learning, new knowledge, um, and really thinking about the student experience as a whole. So you'll hear more about some of the curricular approaches that we adopt there, um, but again, it, it's an interesting space because we have people from very many different backgrounds working together. So again, a lot of the uh, approaches we've adopted in integrate themes of innovation, collaboration, and inclusion. The inclusion in particular we have found um, really important for infusing through all of our activities. So what makes us unique, um, you'll hear about this, uh, that what makes our Vantage One programs unique, you'll hear about the curricular approaches in a little more detail when Sandra uh, talks. But at the highest level, we are, um, there are many programs at this university that deliver enriched first year programs. One of the unique takes that we have on it is that we view students as novice scholars. So we've introduced a number of uh, things into our courses as well as uh, research experiences, and, and a conf capstone conference. So that's kind of a unique take that we um, have in our program. We also focus on both disciplinary knowledge and language orientation. So that is definitely a unique um, outcome of our project or of our uh, programs. And you'll hear about the curricular approaches uh, today that are more um, really take this content and language embedded uh, approach or based approach. So I'll leave um, that for you to cover in a bit more detail, Sandra. So at the highest level, the, here's how a pict picture of how students um, can progress through the Vantage One program. So the Vantage One programs are specifically designed, we call, sometimes call them pathways, uh, for international students to complete, uh, begin the complete their first year, begin their UBC degrees. So when they enter, they are uh, enter as UBC uh, students. So Vantage students meet all the same academic requirements as uh, students in their corresponding, we call them sometimes direct to faculty entry programs. They are one band lower on the English language admission standards. So they are, these are students who were the top student in their school and they are all multilingual students. We currently run three different programs, the Vantage One Arts program, Science program, and Engineering program. And we have three little mini blocks there to show that we, our program in the first year actually runs over three terms. So this, instead of, it's an extended 11-month experience instead of the typical two-term, eight-month experience that most uh, other students at UBC would navigate. So we have an extended summer term that becomes part of our program. Um, you will, and then students, after successfully completing their Vantage year, progress into years two to four of their degree program, um, and I'll show you some data that they um, are, in, at that point, indistinguishable from other students um, that you might see in your classes. So when I ask that, if you're some, a faculty member who teaches a year two, three, or four class at UBC, you may have some Vantage students in your classes. You will note that our engineering program actually has streams where students, so they actually have a dual campus experience. So the, the students spend from September to April on the Vancouver campus, and then they spend their extended summer term, May through middle of July, at the Okanagan campus. And then it's, uh, students can choose to either complete their degrees um, at the Vancouver campus or at the Okanagan campus. The Faculty of Applied Science, which runs our engineering programs, um, is it one of those uh, dual campus. It's one faculty that runs across both the UBC Vancouver and UBC Okanagan campus. Um, if we look at how many students we've had in the program, this graph shows you the enrollment trends over um, since our inception. So the first, uh, we first started enrolling students in 2014. Many of those students have now graduated, um, and actually almost all of them. The and then in 2015 we introduced the was the first year that we introduced the Vantage One Engineering and the Vantage One Management was an Okanagan. Um, only uh, program that we have since uh, ceased enrollment in. So it ran from 2015 to 2018, and then we have suspended enrollment because the enrollment was quite low. So you can see there's quite a few um, Vantage students enrolled in, in our programs. 
Um, and we, we have seen those students now make the full cycle to, through to graduation. This year will be the first year that we were able to track things like six-year graduation rates, which is the UBC metric for how um, long it takes a student to uh, graduate. We've seen most of our students graduating in a four to five-year time frame for their degree. So um, this slide here shows you some data about how many of our students progress into the second year. And it also shows you the exact enrollment, total enrollment in Vantage One programs per year. So we, to give you a sense, this year we have 436 students enrolled in our first year Vantage One program. The stats that are shown below each one of those pictograms showing the, the scale of enrollment for us, it, it shows the number of students, percentage of students that uh, progressed successfully into second year. To progress successfully, students need to uh, pass all of their courses, and this is an extremely intensive uh, course uh, uh, program where they take academic English, you'll, you, the courses you'll hear about momentarily, as well as all of their first year um, disciplinary courses. To progress, they need to maintain, a, they need to pass all those courses and maintain an academic average above 60%. So it's quite high standards. And in last year, um, we, you can see that there has been a growing um, increase in that retention rate or progression rate into second year. Um, there's not really one cause and effect, but you can see uh, that we've been really attentive to this and thinking about ways in which we can improve program retention, ways in which we can adopt our curriculum, ways in which we can um, adapt our advising practices so that we have early outreach to at-risk students. So we've done many, many things to help with um, increasing the success rate of students. Even the students that don't progress, we often know um, and have connected with them and know where they go. So the, the sort of 10% or so, 11% that uh, was not, did not stay at UBC, some of those would have been students that um, did not engage, never came, showed up to class. Others would be students who um, were unsuccessful in their first year, but then decided to, um, with perhaps the advice of our advisor, take a different uh, path. Um, maybe enrolling at one of uh, local colleges to pursue, maybe changing their degree program. Uh, so we often are able to connect with those students and find them the more appropriate path for their success. We have also, um, we are also tracking these students, all of these students, and over a five-year period, we have longitudinal data of how these students are progressing through their degrees, um, how their, uh, what their grades look like, and where they're what degree programs they are graduating from. So this infographic shows you um, for our three uh, program, largest programs that we run right now, what the fourth year student averages are for Vantage students. So Vantage Arts students in the upper uh, corner there, they're, if you group them as a pool for one intake year and then compare them to all other students, they have um, average grades across all the courses they take of 72% in their fourth year level courses. That compares to when you um, compare to sessional averages for domestic and international to 74. So these are, there are very academically strong students. They had um, uh, a good experience in first year and then when they get to fourth year, they continue to be quite strong uh, students at our university. Science, um, the numbers are there. We have a 70% average. Um, and again, the numbers aren't necessarily significant, but these are comparable averages. For engineering, we do have a bit of a smaller cohort, um, and we do see quite strong students um, with fourth year average grades of 75% compared to sessional averages at 71. Again, what I would say for the, 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 these grades is that these are comparable. Um, another fascinating thing that we've been doing is tracking where Vantage students uh, go in their degrees, which degree programs they graduate from. And it turns out that um, Vantage students uh, gra have graduated or will graduate um, if we look at the first three years of in student intake from over 200 different programs of both across both of our campuses. I didn't even really know, I had to check that because I was like, 
do we have 200 different programs? And we do. We're a big university. And students can combine degree programs in really interesting ways and can do majors and minors. So each one of these unique counts is some a student combining a major and a minor in a unique way. So we, we really do see Vantage students uh, spreading out all across the university. They start in these first year arts, science, and engineering programs, but they can go to many, many different majors and minor specializations, just like any other UBC student. So we have students uh, graduating at eight different faculties. The uh, applied science and arts and science makes sense. Those are uh, the pathways. Um, but we also have commerce students at Faculty of Education, Forestry, and Land and Food Systems. Um, where these students uh, would then transfer into those faculties and do majors. We also have students um, combining um, majors and minors in really interesting ways. And um, I'd like to do some follow-up research on that because I think these students take quite an inch, a set standard timetable where they combine lots of different uh, courses um, and it may set them up to actually uh, continue their interests in a lot of the different courses they've been exposed to. We also have students graduating at the Okanagan campus across 13 different programs. And again, we see the same thing. We see them in engineering where we'd expect them, in management where we'd expect them, but also in the School of Arts and Science. So we're really proud, and I, I try and make a point of going to uh, all of the graduation ceremonies uh, in which a Vantage student graduates, but that may become unsustainable. <laughs> and numbers are one thing, but we also, in this um, program, have the privilege of getting to know our students. So in the first year, uh, because it's a cohort-based model and because we have this holistic, we really do get to know students. And so graduation becomes a pretty great celebration because we have connected with the, many of these students and their stories. Um, and this is a picture of Aya. Aya graduated last May, and we will have another student that we can highlight graduating this May. Um, and Aya is really a special student. They all are special students, but she was, um, we've highlighted her in some of our student recruitment materials, which this graphic is from, because she was really involved in student life. She was, um, I think she, this is the Kendo Club that she was uh, involved in the uh, executive. She also came back to Vantage after her um, first year and served as in our peer mentor program where we have 10 peer mentors who help uh, the incoming set of students. Um, and uh, she worked also then, even after that, as a work-learn student in our office. And we hire about six work-learn positions each year. Not always Vantage students, but often Vantage student. Um, and most, most recently, I think just about a month ago, she uh, is now working at the Center for Student Careers and Involvement uh, on campus. So we're, we're pretty uh, proud of her and the experience. She was our speaker at our graduation ceremony, and she talked about... Um, sort of the power of being afraid of things and really just putting your out, yourself out there and, and going for it when you're afraid of things. And so it was, it's just so rewarding to work in this program where you see students really navigating a very large transition and doing that successfully and then growing as people. So uh, I found that quite rewarding. I'll give you just a few more stats about the program before I turn it over to Sandra. Um, I wanted to give you a sense. I, some of you know this because you teach in the program, but most of the audience was new to Vantage. So we have a number of faculty who teach in the Vantage program. Our faculty um, are hired across um, either here at Vantage or, or in partnership with uh, de home departments. And so we actually have partnerships um, in four different faculties, and across 18 different departments. We have 55 faculty members currently who teach in um, the Vantage One programs. Um, and very good gender parity in who we have involved in the program. We also have uh, a number of different faculty types. So among the full-time faculty positions that we have, about half are tenure track um, positions. Most of them are educational leadership uh, stream positions. Um, all about, about one, um, and the rest are our lecture positions. Um, we do um, have faculty involved each year, um, a small pool of sessionals, but the majority of the teaching is done by full-time UBC faculty. 
We also um, have the program set up so that faculty and staff and students are all very closely connected. So I wanted to give you a sense of, of what those structures look like. Um, and this graphic shows some key staff and student positions at Vantage. Uh, I mentioned already that we have a peer mentor program. So each year we hire 10 former Vantage students to be um, peer mentors in the program. Uh, we have a core uh, group of advising staff, and all of those staff members um, have, uh, so we have a staff, embedded staff person per faculty, as well as a, a counselor, and all of those are shared models, so that um, they spend half their time here at Vantage and half their time in the faculty. And this means that a student can get to know an advisor here in the Vantage year, but then continue to see the same advisor as up through years when they get into their senior years of their degree. We have uh, seven people on our student services team, so those are the people e e um, answering emails. They're the people also filming today's talk. Um, and they are often helped by WorkLearn students. Um, and then we have uh, a key pos leadership position, um, uh, our curriculum manager and faculty liaison that provides a link between the college and the CTLT, the Center for Teaching and Learning here at the university. So we have a great staff team, and our faculty are, are really uh, benefit from their expertise. <clears throat> I mentioned already that our, our program takes a unique um, uh, approach um, in viewing students as um, scholars, um, novice scholars. And so what I wanted to show you is um, a little clip of our capstone conference. So students throughout the program actually take a uh, Vantage course code where they do a research project of their own design. Again, a novice scholar approach in that these are first year students. But then the last two days of all the Vantage One programs involves a capstone conference where these first year students come together in this space on the third and fourth floor to do, have an academic conference. And we have our art students, our engineering students, and our science students all together at that conference. So I wanted to show you um, what this looks like. It's now my pleasure to declare the 2019 Vantage Capstone Conference officially open. Capstone is the culmination of a year's worth of hard work, research, interesting ideas, and it's a brilliant way to top off the first year at university. The theme that you have chosen for this year's conference is Stepping Out to Inspire. How do you sum up something so big and something so momentous in three words? Innovation. Precision. Teamwork. Friendship. Very unique. Interesting. Creative. Challenging. Sustainability. Enjoyable. Pretty fun. Meaningful and useful. Diverse. Fantastic. And exciting. This is your chance to celebrate the wonderful achievement that you and your peers have accomplished through your respective projects. Thank you, Capstone. 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 Congratulations. So with that, introduction to Vantage, what I'd like to do now is turn it over to Sandra to talk a little bit more about some of our curricular approaches and what makes those unique. All right. Thanks, Joanne, and hello, everybody. Yes, I'm going to put it right now. Okay, so um, earlier, Joanne um, sort of mentioned some of the ways in which Vantage is unique, I'm going to dig deeper into some of the aspects that, that make 
um, particularly our curriculum and pedagogical approaches quite unique in the context of the Vantage programs. Um, as we mentioned, Vantage is a first year pathway degree program for multilingual English language learners. And um, we, we see this as a wonderful opportunity to already uh, welcome students from, from various parts of the world and, uh, and help them feel um, at home, at home uh, by, by first participating in the context of our program. Um, we, we know that our students bring a wealth of knowledge. We also know that they're highly accomplished. They're multilingual language learners, and there's lots that they have to offer. So, so that's how we see our students. Um, in, in everything we do, we try to see the, the half glass full, if you will, and try to help our students also acknowledge that about themselves. Um, so in our pedagogy, we try to figure out ways, and it's not easy sometimes, to, um, to really welcome them to become more linguistically and culturally responsive in the ways we, um, we teach them. We use a variety of teaching strategies, some of which you know, um, are well known to some of you, task-based learning, project-based learning. Um, because this is a hub for pedagogical innovation, what we are able to do is sometimes combine those strategies in unique ways. We are also able to say, mm, this didn't work, let's reflect on why it didn't, and move on and do something else. Um, we draw particularly on one pedagogical approach um, that can be implemented in many different ways. Um, it's known in the literature as the integration of language and content. And uh, we try to acknowledge this integration between language and content at various levels. So at the program level, we have set up the program, the kinds of collaborations that need to happen um, for this exchange of understanding of disciplinary knowledge and the language and literacy practices that are required in each of the disciplines. Um, we're also doing it at a more meso level within each of the courses and a more micro level when we provide feedback to students, for example. I'm going to explain um, some aspects of how we're trying to integrate in the next few slides. Um, we also um, uh, have chosen to adopt um, is an explicit uh, linguistic orientation to underpin um, our pedagogy, and this pertains particularly to the academic English programming side of things. So um, all our students in the Arts Vantage program, for example, take the courses that are from uh, social sciences and humanities, but together with those courses, they take courses that focus on academic English language and literacy. And in those courses, we um, design our curriculum and lessons and materials drawing on uh, systemic functional linguistics. And I'll also talk about that in a little bit. And, um, and all of these different exchanges that are required um, have... Um, of course, expected us to engage in different kinds of collaborations and have led to interesting within the same discipline as well as across disciplines, as well as interdisciplinary kinds of collaborations and also collaborations between all the educational community in Vantage College and beyond. So, um, as I mentioned earlier then, our approach focuses on this idea of there being sort of a continuum um, where um, learning um, will all, not only learning, any kind of language used um, will include um, a focus of both on content as well as the language that we use to not only convey that content, but also even construe it. Um, the language choices that we make will actually make meaning. And, uh, and so we try to help our students understand how this happens. Um, we see the learning of language not as just the ultimate goal. We also try to help our students to see how they learn through language and also they learn about language. So as I mentioned, um, this is an example from the arts program. Our students will complete in term one. Um, at the top level there, um, shaded in the, the, the red um, colors are the uh, arts courses that the students take, polyscience, psychology, and sociology. And shaded in the more bluish area, um, there's a couple of 
academic English program courses, LLED 200 and Vantage 140, as well as um, a writing studies course. And, um, and what I try to depict here is this notion of how none of these courses is either devoid of content or devoid of language and literacy. But what we're trying to do in each of these courses is maybe highlight some aspects of one or the other more. Um, as you can see, our students do an intensive term one with six of these courses. They continue with another intensive term two with six, and they add one more course, Vantage 148, which is a course that prepares them for their research programs. They're introduced to research methods, to how thinking and talking about, a research, about research looks like. And uh, in term three, they take an elective course from a pool of options that are available to them. And they also take um, the second part of that research course. And they work on the final research project, which they present at the Capstone Conference. All along, our students are supported um, particularly by members of the Academic English Program when it comes to questions that have to do with um, academic English, um, sometimes also study skills, and, uh, and literacy questions more broadly. And, um, and also students are, um, have access to workshops that we offer to help them uh, better develop those research skills as well in Term 3. So, um, I'm zooming now more now into one of the academic English programming courses, the Vantage 140. In the literature, this kind of course is known as an adjunct course. Adjunct means that it is connected to courses that um, focus on disciplinary knowledge. So um, the example here is portraying Vantage 140 in connection to sociology, psychology, and polyscience. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we are focusing in these courses on the literacy practices and the particular language features and through examining language patterns that students would really need to be familiar with and also use in order to communicate effectively their understanding of ideas in all of those courses. Um, this, of course, um, has also um, in some ways pushed us to think creatively about the kinds of assignments that we want to engage students in because we want to give them very relevant opportunities to um, integrate the language and content and to put into practice some of the uh, key understandings about how language works. And um, the Systemic functional linguistics is the language theory that we're using precisely to try and help our students figure out what those particular language patterns are. Now, what is systemic functional linguistics? It's a theory of language that sets out to explain how humans make meaning. So it's not really a theory about language in education, but it has a lot of applications for language in education. Um, the way it sees language is instead of us um, a collection of grammar rules that are quite prescriptive um, and that are typically um, often taught as decontextualized, uh, for example, word order, you know, these are the rules, subject, verb, object, and that's, you need to learn it. Um, systemic functional linguistics um, does not deny that and it, it, it builds on that understanding that grammar, you know, has certain rules but that these rules are really not uh, necessarily um, um, devoid of any meaning, if you will. What we are trying to help students understand is that we always have choices when we are communicating an idea. And academic writing, as we all know, and academic speaking, and academic language use in general, is a new language for almost, well, for everybody who encounters it for the first time. And it's even perhaps more challenging, as research has shown, for those that speak, in this case, English as an additional language. So um, we try to help students by providing lots of examples where language, and particularly academic language, is used in a specific context. And the contexts that are closer to our students are those of the different disciplinary courses they're engaged in. So for the language-oriented courses, we borrow or work together with the disciplinary instructors teaching those courses, pick and choose 
um, readings, kinds of assignments that the students maybe struggle more with, and use them for the creation of curriculum and custom design materials so that the students um, become more aware um, through explicit analysis of language patterns in all those texts, for example. So what we are trying to do here is to enable students to become inquisitive. They need to ask questions about how language works, not only in an academic context. They can also use that, of course, in everyday language use. And the idea here is to really try and, and, and address the mission that we all should have um, of you know, helping uh, persons to uh, be able to interrogate the wording and the meaning of any utterance. Why these words? What might they achieve? To, work, to whose loss and to whose benefit? As Rukhaya Hassan, um, Halliday's um, wife um, would say. And Halliday, by the way, Michael Halliday was the, the founder of this um, systemic functional linguistic theory that has been used in, for, for many decades now, particularly very successfully in Australia, but also more recently in North America and in European contexts. So what are the kinds of questions that our students would be able to answer and that we, we try to help them pose when we're teaching them through systemic functional linguistics? Well, instead of just picking and choosing passive or active voice for variety, we want them to ask a question such as, why is passive voice used frequently in academic genres, just as lab reports and academic thesis, and how is meaning affected by the choice of passive voice? If we're not using passive voice, um, or if we are using passive voice, what does not get mentioned? What kind of meaning gets foregrounded? I won't go over all of the other questions, but this is sort of, again, the inquisitive nature um, of the kinds of thinking we want our students to engage with. This systemic functional linguistic is also understood as a trinocular perspective because at the core of SFL is this idea that whenever we're using language, we're talking about something, right? So there's a subject area topic. So we're looking at the field of the utterance. We're also establishing relationships or portraying a relationship or doing a relationship um, through the choices of language. And we're also interacting in some kind of mode um, and, uh, and organizing the text in particular ways. The conversation over the phone is very different as um, you know, a letter, for example. So this trinocular perspective allows us to, um, to try and constantly keep in mind that all those choices that our students as writers, for example, are making will have an impact. But if they only look at the content, if they only look at vocabulary, for instance, and they don't look at um, the ordering of information, the, the texts might still be prog problematic, for instance, right? So what do we do? We hope to help students become aware of how when we're using language, language can be always uh, put sort of along a, a continuum of more spoken-like or written-like. And sometimes when we, when we, you know, if I ask uh, the audience here perhaps even, you know, why does it sound more academic? Well, you know, you might give some examples. Well, be, because it has a long word or a complicated sentence structure. But that doesn't really allow us to answer in a more systematic, thoughtful way. So we give our students tools to be able to do that. We want our students to understand that all these choices that they're making about the topic, about how the relationship between the interactants and about how the text is conveyed um, have an impact on the text and that can take the text towards a more technical, which would likely be more abstract side, or towards a more everyday, colloquial, concrete side of things. And we use this as a heuristic um, for making explicit the shifts in register. Register is this notion of looking at language as having three different kinds of meaning that are constructed simultaneously when we're talking. So, um, how do we do that? Well, we first introduce them um, using a few classes, not just five minutes as I just did with you, to this notion of idea, you know, um, language being along this continuum and that the choices we make are very important. Our students come with, 
with some foundational understanding of traditional grammar. So we build on that and we add the layer of meaning of how those choices are going to have an impact. So we will build tasks, exercises, different opportunities where they will look, for example, at things like, okay, what kinds of noun phrases am I using? Or what kinds of um, modality choices am I making? And how will those impact meaning? I don't have time here to go into more detail, but hopefully this gives you sort of a sense of the kind of ethnographic work in terms of text analysis that our students engage in. Um, so bringing you back to this idea of constantly trying to connect language and content, um, we could say that the two uh, academic English programming courses that are embedded within Vantage are meant to do two things. Well, many things, but two main things. One is to provide some foundational knowledge, some meta language, some understanding at a bigger picture of how language works. And uh, we also look, for example, at foundational uh, types of texts, like how do you write a definition? How do you write a data commentary? Or how do you write a problem solution? But we also connect them in the adjunct courses to concrete instances in which those particular types of texts are used in real life texts. So the learning that happens is very much contextualized in the learning context of our students. And at the same time, because they're learning about an approach to looking at language, they can take this understanding, they can take this as a toolkit that can transfer into the future um, uh, opportunities. Not not only learning, but certainly uh, for further academic work and beyond. This is an example of a particular course. Um, a sociology instructor works together with the academic English program instructor in trying to figure out how to best support the students. For the sociology course depicted in the, on the red hand side, um, the students um, uh, the course asks the students to develop a sociological perspective on complex everyday issues such as social inequality, social institutions, and social change. I mean, these are big topics, as you can see. Um, so how can we help our students to be able to fulfill that learning outcome of a sociology course, which requires uh, quite a bit ask? Well, the Academic English Program instructor figured out that um, enabling um, providing students with, a pos with the opportunity to um, better uh, tease out some of these notions and then um, uh, prepare um, for a big assignment they had to submit, which was a final paper for the sociology course, they could do an oral presentation. And the oral presentation involved, uh, well, first listening to a podcast, the skill of summarizing it, the skill of explaining a sociology concept. And here you see from the foundational writing course the notion of the explanations, how important it was for the students to understand what kinds of verbs are used to give an explanation, for instance. We also ask them to analyze a podcast with respect to this concept in sociology. Then the notion of discussing what is an argument, what is the language for argumentation now, and, uh, and then finally to facilitate a discussion. As you can see, there's a lot of things that are covered in a sequence of lessons that, that take the students throughout this entire process, and they have to do with language, with literacy skills, with critical thinking skills, with study skills, and with both spoken and written, and actually all four skills. So what are some of the lessons learned so far, um, having done you know, a number of years of work together, um, trial and error, and also having reflected on this? Well, one of the lessons we, we learned is connected to collaboration. Um, when initially we set up the program, um, we had a very rigid form of adjunct course, for example, where we paired up one academic English instructor with one disciplinary um, instructor. Um, and that worked well, but up to some extent. So, um, so that model still continues today in some cases, but we've also made it more flexible so that it better meets the needs of the students as well as the demands of having to constantly revise curriculum so that it sort of mirrors and goes uh, 
uh, hand in hand with what the disciplinary instructor is teaching in the class. So we have a, a spectrum of collaboration kinds that I mapped uh, along this continuum. Um, where, you know, from one end, AP instructors sometimes just asking for information. Um, at, at the other end, potentially also sometimes team teaching. We have some instructors, for instance, now involved in experiential learning opportunities, and they have worked on the assignment together, they have looked for the opportunities to do these experiential learning visits together, and, um, and their assignments are also going hand in hand. Um, uh, we've also been able to more formally gather some of the insights that have been gained from these collaborations experiences, uh, both the challenges as well as the keys to success. And um, so we, we know that uh, there is a number of interpersonal aspects um, that are more sort of at the individual level that will enable these collaborations. And, um, and this is based on, on some of the research I've done with, with the participation of many of our faculty members here. Um, so inevitably, um, when um, instructors pair up and they share goals and a vision for collaboration and for student learning, when they develop a sense of mutual stress, trust, when they, there's respect for and willingness to share expertise with collaborations and acknowledging their own areas of expertise, and when there's ongoing communication, collaborations are successful. But we also need to acknowledge the fact that we've had to um, improve some of the structures that would enable and then sustain and acknowledge the extra time and effort that takes to collaborate. Um, physical spaces, for instance, have an impact. Uh, so we've tried to uh, use our spaces to maximize those opportunities of sometimes even impromptu encounters in the hallways. We've communicated explicit norms for collaborations. Um, we've sometimes had uh, also opportunities to acknowledge, for example, on workload uh, assignments, some credit allocation towards collaboration. And we have also provided some opportunities where instructors through reading, through workshop sessions, um, have access to training on collaborative practices and also on the functional approaches that are used in the academic English programming. And um, I'm not saying that, you know, we've done a perfect job so far, but we've certainly um, making progress and also learning from from the reflection on all of these different uh, instances in which we have engaged in, in collaborations and in training and so forth. So what um, have our instructors, uh, our colleagues said, I'm just looking at the time, just making sure we have enough time to uh, go through this. Um, well, instructors initially were sometimes a little bit um, apprehensive, let's say, uh, that's actually their own word. Um, yet after having collaborated, this person in particular, over a couple of years, um, this person acknowledged that collabor collaborative teaching is now the way um, that this person feels has to, it has to be done. And um, we also uh, appreciate the, the comments from some of the disciplinary <coughs> instructors, many of them, that have also visited the academic English classes. And uh, so the idea is really to do this mutual exchange, not only the academic English instructor visiting the disciplinary course or soliciting materials, but also the disciplinary instructors familiarizing themselves with what is going on in the class. And that has been also very rewarding for them. Uh, one of them saying, for instance, I am much more aware of how big of an opportunity it is to have English, the academic English program advantage, not just as an add-on. Um, the add-on is, you know, in reference to the typical way in which students learn academic English. They either do it before they start a program, or even if they do it while they're also taking other courses, typically there is no interaction or minimal interaction between these two types of courses. So this is certainly an acknowledgement of, of how um, this kind of approach to curriculum is not only positively impacting our students, but also our faculty and um, 
uh, who have become more language aware, for instance. And you know, the next quote even uses some of the meta language that we teach our students, like uh, information structure, given new, what kind of information would you put in, in a text uh, when you're first introducing it? And how can you cohesively organize a paragraph, for instance? So um, it's interesting and, and actually rewarding for us to, uh, to hear instructors comment on how they're also finding it helpful. And, um, and, and also, um, we have to say that, um, that our students do not necessarily find um, the courses in our program easy. Uh, it's not a free pass. And if anybody thought that uh, academic English programming would have been sort of like a free for all, and that's certainly not the case, it's not a GPA booster. Um, they are rigorous courses because what is expected of students is actually hard work. Um, but, um, you know, if, if they invest in it, they do well. We've gathered a lot of information also from the students uh, through surveys that we have been conducting since the first year of the program. Students complete three surveys, um, one in term one, one in term two, and a major survey, which is an exit survey at term three. Uh, we also conducted focus group and interviews with students. And, uh, and some of the key themes that we have also um, learned more about through that information connect to issues with integration and inclusion, what is working and what isn't. As I mentioned, we do have a lot of multilingual students, but we also face the challenge of having most of those students coming from one particular kind of linguistic background. And so we are constantly, as faculty and staff, um, and even students themselves, engaged in trying to figure out more effective ways to address this, turn it from a challenge into an opportunity. Um, we've also looked at the kinds of uh, effective support that our students are receiving, not, not only inside the classroom, but outside the classroom. And after the first year, for example, about the program evaluation data, we were able to address some of these very important issues that we had. Um, we actually prepared a, fa a student-facing report, which we shared with the students. And um, the peer mentoring program also started. Um, all academic advisors also um, you know, joined forces and figured out ways in which they could better address the needs of our students. And certainly one of the key themes that always um, resonates uh, highly with students is the fact that they do believe that they gain a lot of academic English proficiency in the context of the program. So from the surveys and interviews, these are some of the quotes that, um, that sort of uh, give you the students' voices in relation to some of those themes, as I just mentioned. And um, this idea of um, you know the, the the importance of the kinds of learning that is happening, the idea of the inclusive spaces that Vantage Program has tried to create, and uh, the kinds of skills that are transferable and that will enable them to understand and analyze all kinds of articles, and you know uh, be able to uh, more uh, consciously establish their own position as writers, for example and how all of this is helping them achieve their goals as learners. I mentioned already that uh, we initially started with one model, the traditional adjunct model, which is depicted on the left-hand side. Um, we've changed uh, the model depending on, on the course, on the, on the curriculum, on the program in this case. Our engineering students, for them, the, the traditional model steam still seems to work very well. But for our science and our art students, we have something that is called more like an integrated uh, or a hybrid model. Um, where the lens might be put more so in one of the disciplines at a time than in another one. Um, so, uh, to sum up some of the key insights in teaching and learning that we've gained from our experiences working with the students, working with faculty and staff, gathering some of the formal uh, feedback, um, has to do with this notion of working with international students, um, and trying to find ways of better welcoming them and uh, recognizing their multilingual repertoires as assets, trying to think about ways in which we can tap into those resources rather than see them as, um, as a stumble, a stum stumbling blocks that will not allow the students to work well. Um, we also have engaged in many conversations about intercultural learning, um, sometimes through group readings, sometimes through um, dedicated spaces and faculty and staff meetings where we've discussed and tried to 
brainstorm examples of how our curricula could become even more uh, attuned to the diverse nature of our student learners and how we actually need to think and step back and think again about um, which kinds of readings we're drawing from and how those may depict or favor particular kinds of ways of learning and ways of understanding the world, which sometimes are in conflict with the kinds of experiences that students um, bring. So it's this sort of balancing act of, on the one hand, helping our students become integrated into this whole culture, navigating group work, navigating assignments, but on the other hand, also um, this idea that these are students that we have welcomed at our institution, uh, which now has almost 25% of international student population. So what are we doing to try to address this situation that we as an institution have chosen to engage with? And Vantage, as working exclusively with international students, is particularly well positioned to try and really try to understand better. So with that said, um, if you have uh, an interest in finding a little bit more about the kind of work we have been doing at Vantage, uh, we invite you to check the research and innovation uh, website of the Vantage College program. I have selected, and I know it's a very small font there, uh, but a number of um, conference proceedings and journal uh, publications that we have already been able to share more broadly. Uh, there's much more. Um, if you're interested, please um, either contact us or visit our website because you can find all of that information there. So, um, I don't know, John, you're going to say. Um, we're happy to take questions, actually, at this point. We wanted to acknowledge um, before we take questions, though, that um, Sandra and I are, are just representing the work of many, many talented people. Um, including the contributions of our, our students. Our students have been amazing. This is uh, this year's uh, this year's jumpstart orientation. Our staff, our many teaching assistants and faculties um, have resulted in their engage, deep engagement with these programs, with the curriculum, and with reflecting on how we might improve has uh, really what um, is the story today. So we're happy to take any questions. Um, I'm also going to leave this uh, QR code up if you, we also appreciate any feedback you have about today. Um, if you have ideas for what uh, you'd like to hear more about, um, there are many things that we didn't tell you about. So if there are things, there is a space on that survey to tell us, uh, give us your feedback about that. And a big thank you to all of you for coming to the first uh, talk in our Vantage Speaker Series. Hope you got a lot out of it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.